I want to tell you a story that was well known in antiquity from Homer. And I'm going to let you guys decide why you think I want to present the story in this way. Odysseus has been away from home for 20 years, and his house is in trouble. It's infested by suitors, uh, over a hundred of them with their slaves, who want to marry Penelope. And Telemachus is powerless. He doesn't even remember his father. He, he was an infant in, in arms when Odysseus went off to fight. And he says, I'm told that I'm the, the son of my father, but I have no idea. So Athena tells Zeus, I'm going to go down to Ithaca and I'm going to empower Telemachus so that he can do what he needs to do against the suitors. And Hermes is going to go to Calypso and get Odysseus freed from her island so that the father and the son together can meet back in Ithaca and solve the problem of the suitors. Now, to do that, Athena flies like a bird down to, Ode uh, to Telemachus, and nobody else sees her except Telemachus. And then she says to Telemachus, my gosh, you look like your dad. And she says, well, you know, people say that, you know, I'm like my dad, uh, no, that I'm his son. And she says, no, you definitely are. And you, what's going on with these bums in your halls? They're eating you out of house and home. He says, yeah, I know they are, but I want to empower you to, to do something. You really are the son of your father. And he was a mighty warrior in the Trojan War. And the possibilities are he's still alive. And I want you to go to Pelos and to talk to Nestor and then Menelaus in Sparta and find out if your dad's coming home. Then Athena leaves him flying like a bird and goes back home. Oh, then Telemachus is empowered and he's going to take uh, the... Uh, his estate back from these people. But he's got to um, fight off these this controversy of, with the suitors that will kill him if he's, a, if he's too aggressive. The Gospel of Mark. Jesus is a young guy. He's baptized by John the Baptist and the Spirit, like a dove, flies to him and says, uh, here's a voice that says, you are my beloved mm -hmm. son. What happens <laughs> after that? The spirit evaporates and he goes to Galilee. He goes home and says, the kingdom of God has arrived. But first, he has to go through the temptations in the wilderness by the devil. And this is a part of the uh, Rankin stuff you have a, a hero who is a young man, he's virtuous and so on, and then he has to slay the dragon, or he has to win yeah, the princess, right. or he has to swim the ocean, or he has to kill um, uh, defeat, the monster. Defeat the sphinx with a riddle. The, this, uh, right. So you have this, this pattern of proving yourself. Now, he proves himself by not accepting all the prerogatives he now has as the son of God, you know, casting, you know, making bread uh, out of stone and casting himself from, but he prefers, he's, he's the son of God, but he calls himself the son of man. And he disguises his identity in Mark because he doesn't want anybody to know that he's the secret, that, ident that, secret that, the secret identity. identity yeah. Because if, if the opponents find out who he is, they're going to kill him. And that's what happens at the end. Now, this is not directly an answer to your inquirer, but it's to say that even the, um, the Markan account is mythological. Even the, the story of Jesus' baptism is mythological, and it's already in Q, and I think Q is already using this model. By the way, the model is the same model for the Buddha. The Buddha is a rich young man. And he um, finds it intolerable that you have this suffering in the world. And he gets rid of his wealth 
and he goes through this difficult time and then he gets enlightenment and he comes back and he's a teacher. So this appears in world religions, but it also appears rather spectacularly in the Odyssey and it's important for the, 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 the general narrative. So to the person who uh, contacted you and us, I would say, Already in the Q document, or, uh, or at least by the time of Mark, you have this heavy mythologizing of the young hero. Now, but that doesn't have anything to do with Nazareth. And by the way, Matthew and Luke both agree in spelling it as Nazareth, not Nazareth. Yeah. Now, there are different interpretations of that, and Mark Goodaken and I uh, talked about it. According to the Q hypothesis, they have um, the, the, the same uh, nomenclature because um, they're both using Q, and Q has that spelling. According to the Far hypothesis, Luke knows Matthew, so he has that spelling, and that probably would, can be congenial to your hypothesis about Nazareth. Um, in my reading, there's reason to think that Luke has reversed priority at a number of points with that narrative because it, is a, it has stronger um, mythological parallels to the Odyssey than the others. And this is an example of how mimesis criticism and the synoptic problem and the problem of the historical Jesus collaborate and dovetail and make things very complex. <laughs> yeah. So I hold to the historical Jesus. I think even Mark has heavily mythologized Jesus to make him a, 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 a consummate, innocent, adopted hero. By the way, Octavian is an adopted son of Julius Caesar. And, right? Mm -hmm. And he becomes Augustus, um, and then um, is the, the primary ruler. And so some people have suggested, and I think it's not bad, that Augustus, the most venerated of the early emperors, was an adopted man, uh, and that Julius Caesar was considered a god. And so he was Divi Filius, he was the son of God, and so on. So these things become very mythically complex mm -hmm. yeah. and politically complex. So we're trying to, uh, I think my contribution is it that very few people try to link Jesus narratives to the Homeric epics and those narratives that are so important in understanding ancient religion. And that doesn't mean Jesus didn't exist, but it means that the processes of mythologizing him began very early. <laughs> what if we take the story of Jesus going back to Nazareth, right, and rejected by his own people, and then he goes to Capernaum and um, apparently goes to Capernaum and calls disciples, and that's the following the Luke version. Now, what happens at Capernaum at, uh, at Nazareth when he goes home? Where did this guy get his wisdom and power? And that the suitors are saying the same thing. Where is Telemachus getting this courage? Mm -hmm. and, um, and why does he think he has this authority? Don't we know? I mean, and, and then the question is his paternity, don't we, or his family? Don't we know his family and so on? And Jesus can't get any help out of his own family. Well, that's what happens with Telemachus. He's in his own home. He can't get any help from there and he has to go off and he sails in a ship that is supplied by Athena in order to go and, um, and, and find word about his father. What happens in the, the Gospels? Jesus calls fishermen to have a boat ready for him to sail the Sea of Galilee uh, when the he goes sea on the... Of Galilee. So <laughs> these, these echoes are not just echoes, they're mimetic strategies to place the story of Jesus in one of the great contexts of a, a youngster becoming to his own, having, in, being encouraged by knowledge of his father, 
proclaiming his kingdom, suffering in, in order to get it done, and then getting it done. Ladies and gentlemen, join MythVision's Patreon not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars and you're helping MythVision grow.